So this talk is about agile software architecture and really just about, I guess, what is software architecture, what do architects do, what is agile, how do those two ideas mesh together. Um, so I'm quite grateful that you all decided to come uh, on Friday afternoon to the last talk to hear about that kind of topic rather than going watching someone show you funny cat pictures. Um, uh, so thanks very much, I appreciate that. Um, and what I want to do in this talk a little bit is kind of address this challenge that uh, I think has emerged for architecture with this idea of people saying, essentially, we don't need architects anymore, that idea is dead. Um, we're all self-organizing you know, organizing collaborative teams now, um, uh, able to spontaneously create great software, and we don't need any kind of architectural direction. Um, that's who I am. Uh, it, it just says that I'm old, really, in summary. The only point I try and pull out ever is uh, this one at the bottom. Um, and by the way, in the UK, English guys is gender neutral, but I probably should change this. I, I was going to change this slide, but I discovered the slight um, uh, problem that... So I changed jobs about two and a half weeks ago, got a new Mac. It, didn't have, it comes with Google's uh, productivity software. So I downloaded PowerPoint and went down to the office of Mac quite happily. And then it said to me, Ian, your Microsoft account is registered in the UK. You are in Portugal, Ian. You can't activate your software. So I can't actually edit my slide deck. But that's fine, but I couldn't, I couldn't tweet that for you. But the point I, I want to raise is that, um, you know, just because I'm standing here doesn't mean that I am particularly smart. Uh, my one positive characteristic probably is that I am, uh, I will just grind my way st through stuff eventually. But I'm probably no smarter than any of you. And you know, really, you could be here. And it's a, difficult, it's a journey that just requires you to take the first steps of giving a lightning talk at a user group, doing a few user group talks, submitting to conferences. And really, it's, it's worth it as a, as a journey. And I'd encourage everyone to have, to have a stab at it at some point. That's where I used to work. Um, but I can't edit the slides. So that's an open source project I work on, Brighter. Who's a .NET developer in the room? It's a Python developer in the room. Um, so we, run, we write a um, framework which kind of for quotes with things like mass transit and service bus. We essentially provide a, a kind of mediator-like uh, handler and dispatcher to those handlers of commands and events. But we let you do it out of process across effectively a message oriented middleware. And we handle all the kind of reliability concerns of generally doing that. And we support all of the key patterns, things like Outbox and Inbox, et cetera. So if you want someone to do the heavy lifting for you on that kind of approach, um, we are an option. OK, what I want to talk about today, um, I want to just dig into a few of the myths that I see out there and try and kind of say, here's some things that I think get, are quite broadly believed about software architects and software architecture that I do not think are true. And their statements have been made by some quite famous people, so I think they're worth challenging. Um, and then I will go into what I think software architecture is, well, not what I, what I think it actually is, but what a number of more learned people than I think it is, talk about what agile is, and then talk about this convergence of the two. Um, and when we get into the myths, we'll talk a little bit about why that has been traditionally seen as problematic in some ways. Um, and then towards the end, we'll talk about this idea of who is the software architect on your team. We probably won't have time for Q&A because there are, I think, 63 slides, and this talk only lasts an hour. So uh, the math is not in my favor of reaching the QA department, but you never know. Things happen. Um, I tend to go off-piste a lot against my own slide deck, so you, I might finish in half an hour. Who knows? Everyone knows who Martin Fowler is? Yeah? <laughs> So Martin Fowler, you know, famous guy, wrote um, refactoring. He wrote the patterns of enterprise application development. And a lot of my early career, I learned an enormous amount from the kind of uh, stuff that Martin captured. Um, a lot would seem to come from, you know, work with people like Kent Beck on early AXP projects and stuff they're developing at ThoughtWorks. But he wrote a famous paper called Who Needs a Software Architect? And if you read that paper, you can get the impression quite strongly that Martin doesn't really like software architects very much. Um, Martin says essentially that 
Uh, software architecture, architects is just a title we give somebody after a number of years of loyal service. Because we've made them like, a, you know, the senior engineer and then the team lead and then the principal engineer. And we need to give them a new title so we can pay them more money so they won't leave the company. So eventually we start calling them the architect. And that's kind of Martin's theory. That's what software architects are. They're just basically very expensive software developers who needed a fancy title in order to stay in the organization. Um, and yeah, his, his wife is also a architect, which becomes an actual building architect, which becomes important later. And so he takes this quote, which we we'll see basically from a number of people, I think it originally comes from Grady Booch, we'll see it again later, saying, architecture is the decisions you wished you could get right early in the project. And so he says, well, actually, then this architecture thing is just things that people perceive as being hard to change. So he says, the architecture of the system are the things that people perceive to be hard to change. And Martin says, well, you know, what really people should do in this kind of position is actually just solve these problems once and for all, or in fact, to make themselves redundant. And one of the examples he uses is database migration. He says, once upon a time when we wanted to change the, 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 the shape of our objects and change the schema or whatever database they persisted to, that was quite a hard operation. And we used to think about it quite a lot and write all these complex scripts by hand. Um, and then came, along came things about Rails with migrations. And we just pressed buttons and effectively generated scripts that affected the migration force. And Mike said, that's ideal architectural thinking, right? Eliminating the need to do any kind of upfront thinking about things and just speed developers along, right? Remove, remove all the impediments to change. And eventually, we won't need architects at all because all the things that are hard to change, which is what architecture is there for, will have been removed. Everything will be easy to change, and we won't need architects anymore. Um, Martin also said they should never hire anyone at ThoughtWorks who had the word architect as a job title ever in their entire lives. So he's, he's a little bit extreme, if you ask me, on this particular position. Okay. And, and he said, oh, you know, my wife's a building architect, and building architects don't do anything to do really with the construction process. They just schmooze important wealthy clients and uh, say, this is how we're going to live in our wonderful building. And that, that is true, by the way. There's a, I don't, you ever heard of Norman Foster? Norman Foster, British architect? Norman Foster's famous because he comes up with these really fantastic schemes for his customers. Most of them are almost completely unbuildable. And there's one firm that specializes in building Norman Foster's designs because they're so hard. Um, so, yeah. And, uh, and so he says, basically, well, architecture is really this, this person that, you know, much more like in some cases, our, our, our point of view, maybe the product manager, right? So he says, we've misused the term from his point of view. The person who really understands what the stakeholder wants and defines how we're going to work with it and how the customer will use it, well, that's a product manager. So the closest thing to a building architect from Martin's point of view is a product manager. So he doesn't really like this idea we've created of architects at all. So, Grady Booch, famous basically, you guys know who Grady Booch is? So behind, very early on, one of the people that wrote kind of the classic books on object-oriented programming. Um, I think he's one of the guys behind the early versions of UML, for example, what became UML. Um, and he said basically, the architecture of the system is the significant design decision. This is kind of where Martin got the quote from, I think, right? Well, we measure significance by cost of change and impact. And you will, have, you will hear this idea a lot, right? This idea that says, architecture is all these hard to change things. It's all these things that where, if I don't make the decision right at the front of the, at the beginning of the process, it will be very difficult for me to reverse that decision and make a later one. A classic one that's always raised is the problem of undo. The idea is that if I don't build in undo early enough, uh, then it's difficult to actually then write it in later. So I have to make some decisions up front which enable me to say, it's going to be important for me to support undo, so I'm going to build it in early because in a year's time, it's going to be really hard to put that into, this, into the software. Okay. And I think the reason that we ended up with this kind of definition, which says, 
architectures are things that are hard to change. It's because of the evolution from waterfall-style delivery methods into agile methods. So Martin is talk, talk, works for a company that sells you, you know, agile transformation. And I'm on the favor of agile, but um, they had kind of an issue in a sense that in the waterfall model, we have these clear phases, right? We have kind of our design phase, our implementation phase, and our QA phase. And architecture was clearly this thing that happened in the design phase where somebody in the room spat out UML diagrams, presented them to the team as sort of a tablet of stone and said, here, I've, I've, I've designed the system. All you need to do now is just write some pesky lines of code uh, and everything will be fine. Just do it like in the UML diagram and it's, it'll be glorious, right? And this is the whole, architecture got a bad name as being very ivory tower, unrelated to the actual problem at hand. And when Agile came along, Agile said, we want to get rid of doing things up front. We want to, you know, the first iteration, you should be writing code and shipping code out the door, basically, you know, the smallest thing you can possibly release to actually show some value from your work, that iteration. So you don't want this kind of planning-y phase up front, right? So, so where's architecture going to sit from Agile's point of view? Because, well, we don't have this upfront phase. So what happened a little bit is they began to say, well, maybe we need a little bit of upfront. And that little bit of upfront is to do the things where incremental re-architecture is going to fail because we've made a lot of design decisions which led us down a particular branch, a set of paths, which mean that actually this particular approach over here is out of reach now. And if we actually decided we needed that, then it's almost too difficult to branch across to find them. We end up with a kind of a hacky solution as a result. So the consequence of that kind of shift from the waterfall to agile and this pushback against doing design to being as little design as possible put people in the position where they began to regard the thing that happens up front which they regard as architecture as being things that are too hard to change okay. all right my problem with this definition is that it makes architecture a temporal property of the system. Right. Architecture exists at any point in your life cycle, you may have to make significant design decisions. The fact that you might want to try and do those before you start writing code is irrelevant to the idea that you're going to make architectural decisions about difficult to change design things throughout the life of your system. So it's difficult to see architecture as kind of this property that occurs in some kind of temporal state, right? And when you go and look at computer science, you discover it's been talking about architecture a lot since kind of the 1990s. That you don't ever define architecture as something that is hard to change. That's not the working definition they use. So the computer science guys, when they talk about what is software architecture, things that are hard to change doesn't enter into their vocabulary at all. All right. So what is, what is software architecture? Let's, let's talk a little bit about what architecture is first. Because the other thing to challenge is Martin's perspective that basically he said, because his wife is a modern architect, that architecture is a building manager. The first person we, we kind of know of that really just defined a, a concept of architecture was a Roman engineer. Now, being a Roman engineer, his job was essentially to build fortifications and then to knock them down with heavy catapults. But he was an engineer nonetheless. And he wrote a book on architecture. It was called Of Architecture, basically. And one of his famous statements is, a building should satisfy three principles, firmitas, utilitas, and venustas. Durability, utility, and beauty. Actually, I'm in a Latin-speaking country, so you may not have needed me to translate for you. I, I don't, it's a new one for me. But yeah, and I actually think that, you know, if you're talking about what architecture is supposed to do in engineering terms, right, that's actually not a bad definition, even today for us in software architecture. The architecture, one of the goals of architecture when you're doing engineering is to build something that exhibits these three properties. It's durable, it's, it has utility, and it has some kind of beauty. Actually, the last one is quite often forgotten. When we talk about non-functional requirements, things like that, we quite often forget beauty. And I think maybe we should perhaps put that back in the frame again a bit more. <laughs> 
Okay. So here's a thought experiment, for example. If you were to go out to, let's say you joined a new team, like I've done recently, and you said to somebody, can you describe to me the architecture of the system? Right. I can guarantee you people don't go to you, let me talk about the things that are hard to change and the upfront decisions we made about them, because that is the architecture of the system. What they'll do, nine times out of ten, is they'll go to a whiteboard and they will start drawing box and line diagrams. Okay? And that is what architecture tends to be. What you might also get is a bit of a history where they do say, OK, pragmatically we made this choice, and here we decided to do this, and at some point, you know, we were never able to solve this problem, so we just hacked around that. And so you do get a discussion about basically some of the trade offs that were made in order to achieve the business's goals. And those two things are what instinctively people will do when you ask them to say, what is the architecture of your system? Draw some boxes and lines, give you a potted history of software development in the organization. That's our architecture. Okay. And that's, I mean, I, every time I, I go somewhere else, that's pretty much the same, the same thing that you get. Okay. And actually, Ralph Johnson was with a guy who uh, Martin Fowler quoted in his article, Who Needs a Software Architect, as, as the guy who originally made this statement um, that it's the hard things to change. Actually had a lot more to say, but Martin, like you know, a good journalist, didn't report on all of those in quite the same way. He said, the sh in, in most systems, the shared understanding of the system by the kind of expert software developers, that's what the architecture is, right? It's how, it's how you and I effectively say, how does this system work? And basically, one of the important things for him was that it's a notion of how the system is partitioned and how those parts that are partitioned talk to each other. One of the things to understand a little bit from that comment is that it isn't necessarily all of the details. When we talk about a shared understanding of the system, when we talk about some of those boxes and line diagrams, there's a certain amount of abstraction going on in architecture. <coughs> We're saying there's some detail here, it doesn't really matter to understand that detail, to understand how the system works. That's how all the parts fit together, how all these moving bits and pieces create motion. Uh, you don't need to actually understand the individual detail inside the boxes. There's a level of abstraction. And we need that, otherwise we just wouldn't be able to cope. We, no one better learn about your architecture, because unless they'd been on the team right from the beginning of the process and written all the code alongside you, there is no way they'd be able to effectively understand it. And so you've got to have that slight lifting of level. Um, and so there's this notion, uh, Ralph Johnson phrases it as the components that are understood by all the developers. But that notion should be understood in terms of the context. Imagine you have like 40, 50 developers all working on kind of separate teams, and, and the architecture is really concerned with the things that they have in common or they all understand, right? not this obscure little bit that these two guys happen to know in the corner that deals with some particular function that they need to work with. Okay. So when we talk about computer science, uh, Mary Shaw and David Garland wrote a book on software architecture. Back in the 90s, they were at Carnegie Mellon University in the US, which did a lot of work on software architecture. And they essentially said, as a system grows, it becomes more important to understand the structure of it than it does to essentially understand individual algorithms and data structures. Okay. Because the problems you have will exist on that kind of macro rather than that kind of micro scale. Now, that isn't to say that an individual team is not going to have to be concerned itself with the algorithms and performance of a particular API it's got, etc. But overall, from the point of view of making this whole reliable, we start to get into the world of saying we've got to deal with the larger building blocks here. And so software architecture could be defined as basically the description of these elements, these large pieces and the interactions that they have between them. Okay. And, so, uh, and what they define in this book is that software architecture is a series of components and the interactions between them. And <coughs> a lot of the work that uh, Mary Short and David Garland did was 
they created a thing called the candidate problems in software architecture. So I think there are 13 problems, and they range across different fields from, I don't know, something equivalent to website to automated uh, navigation aids floating out in the harbor. And uh, the idea was to say, well, if you can effectively define a architectural style, as it's called, which is, if you like, I think of that as a uh, design pattern, but for architectures, where you say, if I had this component and these connectors, and I applied these constraints, these rules about how these components and connectors can talk to each other or what their behaviors can be, then I can predict certain behaviors about that architecture. But I can also then, if I describe many of my architectures that way, compare them and figure out what architectures apply better to some of these candidate problems than others. And so they were trying to basically promote the idea of uh, architecture as a field of scientific research, where we could come up with some method of evaluating by some facts how this architecture, where it could be used, what its strengths and weaknesses were, where it shouldn't be used. Um, so the components are this kind of, the component is the box, right? So when you draw a box, a, a box and lines diagram, you are effectively doing exactly the same thing that Mary Shaw and David Garland proposed back in the 90s. And a component is your bo a, a, a box, and it's the unit of computation, right? It's where stuff actually happens. And a line is a connector, and just a communication path between two units of computation, right? That's how most of you instinctively use it and draw it. Um, I don't know whether that's just uh, that's humanly instinctive or whether um, people learned this and ha got it handed down. But that's effectively where that, those whole boxes and line diagrams come from. So it's actual people mock boxes and lines. You see people going, oh, you know, you're not an architect, you're not doing UML, you should be doing, you're doing boxes and lines diagrams. That's what's rubbish, right? But actually, there's a boxes and lines notation, and it's given in, in their book, a book on software architecture, and it says, the box is where things, where things are computed, and the line are how the things that computer communicate, and you can apply constraints to them. <coughs> Whoops. So this architectural size vocabulary of them. Right. Len Bass, Len Bass also can I can email Mellon, and he come, they came along later and wrote software architecture and practiced a few other people. And he explicitly calls out this idea that uh, software architecture has begun to be thought of as the, hard, the things that are hard to change, and says, we disagree. Um, and they say it's basically the things that effectively you need to reason about the system and its properties. And this notion of reasoning is quite important. Right? If we have the wrong level of abstraction, it becomes quite hard to reason about the system. But at a high enough level of abstraction, we start to talk about the important pieces of the system. Then we can begin to reason about how it might work and what change might happen and how it might impact stuff. And, and that may occur at different levels in different organizations. You know, I've gone from an organization that was kind of like 80 people, 80 engineers to, at its peak to one that's about 500. And so your actual, some of the areas where you're dealing with architecture change a little bit because you're starting to look at even bigger picture. And so you actually have to have even more abstraction. And you, may not, you may not care at the level of what individual teams are necessarily doing because you're trying to create structures that are big enough for you to be able to reason about the system as a whole and its properties and how it behaves and how it works. Okay. And so the, the kind of idea here is that you can say some of the structures in your system are architecturally important would be a way I'd say rather than a structure is architectural and others are essentially less architecturally important. And that can be quite useful to you, by the way. Um, one of the problems architects quite often get when you're working with teams is people don't like the idea that they're being told what to do and micromanaged. And really, you probably don't want to micromanage them, and you don't need to because you don't really care what happens at that level of detail inside the box necessarily. Well, you, I mean, you might care, but you don't have to govern that. What you have to govern is the, com is the components and the connectors and how they all fit together so that basically that team, although it's working in isolation, can work as part of the whole. What you have to have is an understanding of how their work fits in alongside everybody else's work to make the cohesive whole function. Okay. So he gives some examples. Uh, module structures, basically. So module structures effectively um, that the, you know, with, there are whole units of code or data that basically we need to basically build, and those things go to make up our system. Component constructors, this is essentially a, 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 
call back to Mary Shaw earlier. This is the boxes and lines diagrams. How do the parts, once we've built them, how do they connect together? So the top thing is how I build an individual stack. You know, consists of in .NET land a number of assemblies, or in Python land a number of basically modules, etc. The middle one is saying, well, now they need to talk to each other. Uh, and the bottom one, whoops, Daisy. The bottom one is allocation structure. So basically, the other one is quite commonly, well, that's a logical model. We need some physical models, basically, of how we're going to run this actually in a production system. Okay. So one of the things that I would say is that. The problem with um, this idea of important decisions that was raised by Martin and Grady is it's a narrative how we came to live here. Has anyone uh, read anything by Simon Wardley? Talks about Wardley maps, yeah. So he's a very interesting guy. So you're going to find out about Wardley maps. It's, it's kind of under here. But one of the things when I've seen him talk about where he came up with this idea for Wardley maps, which are kind of a business planning tool, he said, when he, when he first became a CEO, he was an ex-developer, and he went to the ranks, became a CEO, he assumed there'd be this book or a set of books entitled, you know, how you do the CEO thing. And there'd be a set of rules, you could follow them, and you would make fantastic businesses happen. Um, and then he said he discovered there weren't. Basically, he, he said, as far as he could tell, most of the management for C-level positions was basically a bunch of self-help books, saying, you know, you know, you are a powerful manager, you are a strong manager, and it's like absolutely nothing to do with running a business. And he was like, well, hang on a minute, how is that going to work? And his analogy for this is he said, once upon a time, if you wanted directions to go somewhere, someone would give you a narrative. And it would go something like, you know, um, when you go down past the third shop where Mrs. Biggins lives, she's lovely, you should pop in and see her sometime. And then you go up the hill past the third oak on the left, um, the one that's fallen down slightly with the bent tree that looks like a duck. Uh, and right, that's how you got somewhere. It, and it works, but it's kind of ineffective. And it doesn't allow you to think about new ways of accomplishing the goal of getting from A to B because you have to keep following this same set of narrative instructions. So nowadays, we use a map. We just get out a map. And the map says, here is A and B, here's a terrain in between, and here's how you navigate it. Right. And when you, all you have as a, as a kind of architectural record is, here is the important and, and hard to, hard to uh, uh, here are the things that are hard to change, the decisions that we made, is you have a narrative like the former, right? You have a description of how to get to get A to B, but it doesn't really tell you anything about wanting to get to C or D, which may be very nearby. If you have a map, if you have essentially some notion of the structure of the system, then you can navigate your way around it. And you can begin to reason about its properties, and you can to reason about what happens under, under new circumstances or when change occurs. And so one of the key things for architecture, for my perspective, is to ensure essentially that you have some kind of map, right? some kind of idea of how the system fits together. Okay. And it's like any map, it's an abstraction and emits some details. Okay. Most maps only go down to a certain level of, you know, uh, need, and they don't give you everything, right? My, my Google Maps in here is fantastic for navigating streets, but there's lots of things it misses out, like, you know, where are the entry points to the sewers? I don't need to know that, thanks very much. It doesn't help me achieve my goal, which is to navigate from A to B. So Google Maps is a really good level of detail for what I need it to do, um, which is get around, but it doesn't solve things that I don't need to understand, like how do we repair the, the mains water, right? There are different maps for that, which the sewage and water companies hold, and they use those when they want to solve their problems. So you need to basically make sure that you don't lose sight in the detail of enough, a broad enough picture to be able to reason about software architectures. So this is um, Sun Tzu, and basically it's the age-old wisdom that um, you have to understand the terrain that you are fighting in. If you do not understand the terrain, your enemies will overwhelm you, right? And that's really what an architect is trying to do. Understand the terrain on which the battle is being fought. Create a map so you can figure out how to do that. So here are some classic maps. Uh, there are lots of different approaches to documenting software architecture. We'll just touch on a few. I'm not trying to teach them to you, just to just kind of call them out. So this is called the four plus one view. Um, the four plus one view has, a, has, has says well, you can represent actually the 
software in different, different forms. So this logical view is where you and I might think of a UML diagram of your classes. It kind of says, hey, how is the functionality provided by the objects that basically the code that the developers are writing? The development view is slightly higher level than that. It's the components that essentially those classes form part of that go to make up the software. This level is, is, is interesting detail, but this level actually is better for helping you reason about things. And nowadays, quite often, uh, we don't tend to write so many of those sort of class diagrams because we're not trying to do end-to-end -end generation of code from diagrams. But these are still incredibly useful, this idea of what is a component, how does it talk to the other components here. Process views, which are effectively says, well, how does the whole thing actually run? You know, I mean, when I turn this logical abstraction into running processes on basically a, a disk, how's that going to work? And the physical view, which essentially is all about things like networks and boxes that it's deployed to. That's where your diagram of your AWS kind of landscape goes, right? This one's by Simon Brown. Anyone heard of Simon Brown? So this one's, uh, so if you, if you do have any kind of, it has got a great book called From Developer to Architecture. So people that um, are in developer roles that get kind of pushed up to an architectural role, uh, it's quite, quite a useful book. He has a thing called the C4 diagram. So the C4 diagram is context, containers, and components. And I, don't, I don't expect to read the diagram here. It's quite small. It's not for, we're not going to run through on Simon's examples. But the idea effectively is to say, here I define a context, which really just says I have a system. It, I live in my organization. It talks to things outside my organization. It is used by consumers, effectively, et cetera. Then you have containers. So containers, at his next level down, are essentially bits of the system kind of that are running, hosting some kind of infrastructure. So a container is something like, from a .NET point of view, an IAS app server, right? an application server that is running some code that effectively talks to your users, that talks to maybe a database in the, ba in the, in the, back, in the background. So it's the big pieces that are actually running. right? So here we have something, I think it's a web application, talks to a relational database. Um, it's got a... Uh, no SQL store, effectively that kind of thing. Et so what, is the, what are the large moving parts of your application? And down here, you have the component model. So I break one of those containers down, and I actually get components, bits of my system that effectively fit together to do what I need. It's all documented on this website. You can go and, go and find someone's website and see quite how it's done. But this is actually quite helpful to orient you in terms of drilling further down into the system to get a sense of the structure. And it's quite interesting, even at this level, you can begin to see, you know, and this level is roughly equivalent to a kind of microservice. Um, is there consistency? Are all of these built entirely differently? Do the teams basically have entirely different strategies for dealing with these problems, right? How diverse is my landscape in terms of the, the kit that I'm running everywhere? And at this level, you get a feel for what are the significant uh, concepts without having to understand the detail of the actual classes that make them up. Right. So this is my order processing. It may have some kind of shopping basket or whatever effectively goes inside it. So I can track down that. And that also helps understanding ownership of which team tends to own this particular area of the system and behavior. And I can go and talk to them and figure out what their problems are or whether they've done things right or wrong. OK. This is essentially a boxes and lines diagram from architectural styles. This is how you do a component connector diagram if you want to be a little bit more strict than if you're doing whiteboards. So this is essentially a box representing a locus of state. Your line is your connector between uh, two items. This is essentially a port. That's where effectively you connect into a component. And you're, it's usually defined as a role. And the idea is that you basically can start with one box, right? And you could say, that's my system. And then they're, they're decomposable. So that box itself will consist of another set of boxes and lines. And you go all the way down with boxes and lines. So really, that's just a more sophisticated version of that, right? So I was actually giving you a slightly stronger guidance on how to basically do that kind of decomposition from essentially that this goes, this box becomes. Uh, a number of these boxes, which become a number of these boxes, right? Um, okay. So imagine that you join a team, and 
you've, you've been now through the exercise, you said, okay, draw me the architecture, and you've got some boxes and lines diagram up, or maybe you've got a C4 diagram, or a 4 plus 1 diagram, or some fancy UML, and, and you're saying, okay, um, the next question I need to understand is, is the architecture you've, you've drawn any good? I remember we talked earlier about the idea that architecture was about saying, hey, this is, I'm building something, and I want to build something that has these qualities of durability, utility, and beauty. How, how am I going to figure that out? Um, most likely, you'd probably want to look for a number of things. Suitability for purpose, right? How well does this architecture meet the business problem that they've been presented with? Have they just decided that they read an article basically on a blog post last week and they really, really want to do this particular architectural style they saw there because it's going to look great on their CV even if actually it bears no relation to the problem that they have at hand, right? We really must, it's the whole kind of like, you know, checkbox exercise in design. I really must use Kafka. It's going to look great on my CV. I must find some part of this system where I could use Kafka in order to basically make that happen, right? So this be purpose. Essential and not accidental complexity. People don't have to understand this distinction. Essential complexity is the things that I need to do to do the job. And accidental complexity says the tools that I bring with me to do that job may carry with them some complexity that I'm not using. So it's quite commonly seen in, say, software programming languages, right? If I only use 60% of the language and there's another 40% I don't use, that's essentially accidental complexity. It's things that are a burden for me now because people might try and use them, use them incorrectly, or people might just basically say, what is this, and I have a learning challenge, right? So that's accidental complexity, things that I'm not using, which may make the problem worse. So for example, one of the things, for a good example is C++, right? If what I'm doing is just writing a line of business application, the memory management overhead of C++, the fact that I have to do it myself, is probably accidental complexity for me. It doesn't solve any problems that I need to get solved. It's essentially just adding a burden to me to move forward. Whereas if I'm uh, writing a games, uh, games engine, that kind of memory management is, a, is essential complexity for me. I need to better take control of that memory and manage it correctly. So using the wrong tool for the job can give you basically too much accidental complexity. And easy modification to changing requirements. So it's the age-old problem that effectively, you know, version, your, your software effectively spends most of its life changing. And we have to write software that is suitable for change. I once worked with a team that built um, a piece of software, and they, they, they seem to be following all the right steps, right? They work really closely with the customer. He was almost like customer on site. He helped define it. Version 1 was a triumph. Everyone was celebrating how brilliant this piece of software was. And then we discovered, there's written a bunch of contracts, we discovered six months after they'd kind of gone, that changing it was a nightmare. Um, and the way they'd done it, essentially, were a whole load of effectively very uh, tailored stored procedures built for every single page that meant that, that they had no sort of common code for doing common operations, et cetera. And the whole thing was really difficult to change. And that meant we just threw the software away because the, cost of ch the lifetime cost of it was far likely to be too great to actually keep maintaining it. Um, and I think it's like the usual number given is like 90%, I don't know where, where, where that actually comes from as a figure, of your software's lifespan is, f is spent in, in effectively post version one. And if you can't change it, it becomes a very expensive proposition to own. And nearly everywhere I've been in the last few years, one of the key problems has been quite often the first thing I arrive is their problem is that they are stuck and they can't move forward because they can't change the software. Typically, you see this scenario where they've got no unit tests. Because they've got unit tests, they find it, no unit tests, they find it very hard to refactor. Because they can't refactor, quite often they've just forked bits of the software over time because they didn't want to change it. Um, so this thing is exactly like this thing. It has a slight variation, but I was too frightened to change the thing that already existed in case it broke because I didn't have any tests to tell me. So I just forked it and created a new version. Right? impenetrable data structures that are unperformant at the scale they've suddenly, they've succeeded as a business and they're starting to scale up, but the data structures don't work, but people can't change them because everything is coupled into that one data structure. 
And those kind of problems, like in modifiability, are what you know, we would tend to say basically is a bad architecture. Right? And so what we might want to say is, well, we, we should go and look at the quality attributes of the system. I'll define what quality attributes are in a second, for those of you who don't know. The illities, they're sometimes called, right? And what we're looking and also seek basically high cohesion and low coupling. And so if a software architecture has basically appropriate quality attributes, I say appropriate because they do vary, and high cohesion and low coupling, we probably have a good architecture. Um, so this notion of quality attributes, the main place I've ever seen it defined is, is again basically by Len Bass and software architecture and practice. And he says there's a distinction between the functional requirements and the quality attributes, right? And the functional requirements are what should the software do, and the quality attributes are when it does it, what are the trade-offs we are making in terms of our design decisions. So this idea is that you know, there are many ways to skin a cat. There are many ways quite often to build a software solution to solve a given problem. And the question is, which one is better? And the answer is that it isn't really as simple as that. It's, it's why people give you the whole it depends answer. So really, you have a set of sliders. So a, tr a traditional, this would be modifiability. How hard is it to change? Usability, how, how easy is it to use? Security, testability, uh, uh, availability, uh, performance, interoperability. Right? And the, the trick, of course, is, is that you want to slide one along. I want lots of modifiability. You quite often slide others down in the opposite direction. right? So you, so you, you try the modifiability all over, and your performance may drop off. right? I've decided to use an ORM because it means my guys can just basically write uh, plain old C-sharp objects and generate the code out um, uh, for basically the whole persistence layer. And I'm getting to market really fast now. It's brilliant. Right, but then when I come to scale, all that lazy loading is now killing me, etc. Right, so now I have to dial. Suddenly, I, I need to need better performance, need better availability. I, I slide those sliders back, but my modifiability drops off. The code becomes harder to use now. So, for example, one of my prior roles, we had to do a whole thing where we said, well, we we will have no one-to-many relationships anywhere. Right, you can your your children can see the parent. And so effectively, if when we want to do a read from a read store, that's fine. They know who their parent is. But in the write store, we never, ever see scenarios where you genuinely have to load all the children. You're usually working with one child. You just have to know who your parent is. So we'll, so we'll have a rule that you shouldn't ever try and code those into the system so people aren't tempted to write code that says, load this object and all its children. Right? Um, and that kind of problem happens to you because your dials have shifted that suddenly you need to basically pull this, this dial back over here, which is just the other one. And those quality attributes are a, tra a set of trade-offs. And the only way you can figure out whether trade-offs are is to understand the business scenarios that you need to support. How many users, um, how quick it has to be, et cetera. Can the customer wait for a reply on this? Does the customer have to sit there effectively and receive the response in front of them, et cetera? Right. And so there is no answer that says, this architecture is always better than this architecture. There is simply this architecture has tends to support these quality attributes. And if you can map those quality attributes onto a business problem, that's probably a good architectural fit for that particular uh, problem you want to solve. Um, and there are also constraints, right? And constraints are things like, we're, we're, a, we're a Microsoft shop, and we're on Windows servers, right? And you, that's a given. You, you, you just don't get to change usually, and you have to work within it in terms of, in terms of architecture. And so what you can do, so this book, by the way, is it's a guy called Michael Keating, Design It. Anyone read Design It? It's another good book if you, if you have a kind of architectural responsibility. And I don't read Release It, the other book in the Programmatic Programmer series, Michael Nygaard. Through both of those. Programmatic programmers have two really good books of people that have kind of architecture in that title. One is Release It, and the other one is Design It. They're both the worst named books that I've ever come across in my entire life. Release It, as far as I can tell, has nothing to do with releasing software. It's all basically to do with what we would now, go, now call uh, reliability engineering. And Design It has nothing to do with being a UX designer. It has everything to do with being a software architect. <laughs> and leading teams doing architecture. I have no idea why the naming is so bad. I presume that they may come up with a third or fourth book in that series, and it will be equally unclear from the names what the book actually is about. 
but he suggests a thing called a, effectively, a, a quality attribute web. So essentially, I mean, you can use circles, right? But you come up with a series of concentric rings, and kind of at the, at the points, he essentially says, right, you can put the different quality attributes. And then the post-it notes represent scenarios that you need to support. And those scenarios essentially turn the dials on some of these given quality attributes. Uh, closer towards the center is stronger, and closer towards the outside is um, uh, weaker. Um, so the, the idea is essentially that you can see all the things that lead you to given particular trade-offs. Here, you can see that availability is very important to this system, right? More so than modifiability or performance, and security is quite important. So as you begin to map out those scenarios, you can see which of those quality attributes you're tending to push in favor of over others. Because a, a kind of reality is you're not going to be able to satisfy all of them. The, as you slide one way, the sliders push the other way for you at the same time. Okay. Um, and so one of the ideas, basically, in designer is this idea that you partition the system in order to meet quality attributes. Right. One of the reasons you break things up is because that helps you effectively, gives you more flexibility in how you're going to meet those quality attribute requirements. Okay. So we'll talk briefly a little bit about partitioning. Um, how do we partition a system? I mean, that's a whole talk in itself, right? I think, uh, did Adam do his talk about partitioning, I think? Breaking up microservices? He might have done this at Porto. This is the classic. Uh, Domain-driven design, basically, where effectively you do context mapping as an exercise, where you figure out all the bounded context of your system. So bounded context, if you like, is a portion of the domain where you have people who speak a common language in the business and use a set of terminology and generally have a kind of shared perspective of the business. Um, and you can map your system as a whole set of these. I worked for a while in insurance, and insurance is very interesting. It's quite a really nice one to, to try and train your wheels on because there's a notion of policy in insurance. And lots of parts of the business have, a pol have this notion of policy. Claims team deal with a policy. The underwriting team deal with a policy. The actuarial team deal with a policy. But what they actually record about policies are entirely different in each context. So the claims guys are really focused on what is it you're actually covered for. The underwriting team are focused on what is it you're actually insuring. Right? The actuarial team are kind of somewhere a little bit in between, like how do we make money from basically the, uh, uh, this, this whole problem of uh, offering insurance. And I can remember at some point when I worked for this insurance company, the boss came to see me very excited. And he'd been on a golf course, because if you're an architect, all the boss best stories start with your boss being on a golf course. And he said, someone came to me and they said, for $40,000, I can give you a model of insurance. UML diagrams that will mean your team will be saved countless hours of work because they will simply be able to implement this UML diagram. For 40,000, it can be yours. My boss was very excited. He said, this 40,000 pounds seems like a lot, but in terms of development time, we'd, we'd quickly burn through that. This must be the way to reduce our, get, get our products out the door faster in. And I said, well, can I, am I allowed to have a look at this thing before we buy it? And he said, yes, yes, I think they, they said you could have a you know, sort of peek at it. So I had a look. So their policy, they, only had what, they hadn't done any of this partitioning. They just had one thing called a policy, right? And it did life insurance. And it did investment vehicles, basically. I don't, I don't have the same kind of thing over here, but there's a thing called a ISA, which is basically a uh, you go and purchase some shares and stick them in a bucket, and the government doesn't tax you very much, right? And it could do your car, and it could do your massive commercial building. And it's kind of like, well, how many fields does this thing have? Oh, it appears to have something like 800 odd fields in it in this one class called policy, right? And every single part of the business, it had the things they needed. Oh, it's a claim. It's got this whole section of effectively coverage clauses inside it. Oh, it's got this actuarial rating plan built in. And it's like, this thing was enormous. And the problem was, because they just heard the word policy, they went literally round the kind of room and said, well, what do you know about policies? Literally listed it all out and bolted it onto a policy. Whereas what you actually want to do is listen to each individual part of the business that has their own view of the domain and say, I'm going to create a policy for you and a policy for you. 
that is what you care about. Even though, it's, even though the, wo the word is the same, they view it entirely differently. And, you, and I had a number of meetings in insurance where you could see this quite clearly, where you'd literally get people in the room like an underwriter and a claims guy, and they would be arguing. They'd be arguing because the other guy didn't know what he was talking about when he used the word policy. That's quite a clear kind of example. So breaking this, that's we're partitioning the system. And when we talk about basically meeting quality attributes, well, people do that kind of thing and then do things like say, OK, well, we're going to make each one of those in an independently deployable unit, and we'll call it microservices. Right? So that's how partitioning can then help you basically meet some quality attributes. Um, David Parnas, very classic paper, long, you know, classic white papers you, you can go and read um, on the criteria to be used or basically on the decomposition of software into modules. He effectively was the one that people early on which said, you know what, partitioning the system is about hiding the difficult implementation details behind something that's abstract and stable. So up, to, up until that point, a lot of kind of partitioning had occurred by flow. Here are the steps in the system. I'll divide it up into big chunks. Each one of those chunks is a partition. That's my module. And he said, that isn't really going to work. What you're much better off doing is saying, what are the difficult decisions that I have to make? Can I put things that basically all relate to that decision into a bucket? And can I put a stable interface over the top so everybody else can depend on that stable abstraction because my, it won't change very much, but you can change the details. So say, for example, I was shipping things between A and B, and I wanted to have some way of calculating the best route. I can put an abstraction which basically says calculate route, and everyone else can depend on my calculate route abstraction because it just says, well, put in the, you know, the origin and the destination, and I will tell you the, the best way to get there. But if I come up with new and better algorithms for solving the problem of how do I get from A to B by the cheapest possible path, I can change all those internals quite happily and nobody else cares, right? And that, again, is partitioning because it makes it possible for the team that owns that problem to innovate without impacting any of the other teams. Okay. Right. So we're going to segue into what is Agile for a second. So we will come back to some of that conversation in a little bit. Try and put it into your stack and try and remember what we were talking about at the beginning as well. And we'll try and start tying it all together in a second. And magic will hopefully occur from the various threads that I have spun out uh, to, to the audience. So, this is basically what a waterfall project looks like. Has anyone here worked on a waterfall project? Okay. Cool. Uh, usually, the problem nowadays is that there are, there are all too few of us left. Um, uh, and so when you describe Agile, people don't know what it's Agile by comparison to, which is waterfall. But the, the, the essential problem is effectively that uh, it, it, it was designed in a period where effectively computation was expensive. And so it was easier to make decisions on bits of paper uh, and, uh, and theorize about how your software is going to work and then implement it than it was to effectively have some process of iteration which let you do that instead. Nowadays, basically, building and shipping software is very, very cheap, and so we can actually move to a different model. And Alistair Coburn describes this as basically what he says is a late learning strategy, right? So effectively, I build and I build and I build and I build and I build because I don't ship. I learn nothing about the decisions I've made right until the end of the process. So effectively, I carry a lot of risk. So iterative development, so rapid, this is basically rapid development, and rapid development is really where most agile processes come from, kind of said, all right, you know what we're going to do? We're going to deliver in, iteratively and incrementally. We're going to deliver small chunks of, uh, of functionality, and we're going to deliver them on a regular basis. Right? So it's important to be both iterative and incremental. You can't be iterative and not be incremental and still be rapid application development. You can do a whole lot of sprints, but you don't shift them right until the end. It hasn't helped you. Okay? And so that was this notion, basically, of rapid application development. And that, well, as the Grover Coburn would describe that as a risk reduction strategy, right? So I get knowledge very early on in the process about what I'm building, and I'm therefore able to reduce the risk. Because if it turns out I've gone down the wrong path, I can change my course and I can adjust. All right. Now, quick tip. You should ignore the Agile Software Manifesto. The Agile Software Manifesto is essentially a bit like Donald Trump and his summit in North Korea. Nothing was actually achieved, and, but they come out at the end and make a lovely statement, right? So when they made this statement, even about two hours before, Martin Fowler would not agree to call it Agile. 
And this is this, literally this statement is all they could manage to agree on after a number of days of working. But they all had different methodologies that fell into this kind of camp, but that they weren't basically waterfall, like rapid application development methodologies. All right. So that's, that's, lots of people hold this as the tablet of stone of that's what Agile is, and it's not. What is Agile? Um, Agile is basically a risk reduction strategy. And the idea basically it says, I want to effectively perform a series of experiments and get feedback from those experiments. It's a way of shortening your feedback loop as, much, as, fast, as fast as you can to get your data back, right? And it may not necessarily be lightweight or low ceremony. Okay. So, how do we do Agile in uh, architecture and Agile? So this is James Shaw. James Shaw's got a really good book called The Art of Agile, and I, it's a fantastic book. If you want to do XP or anything like that, it's really good. But one of James's things he's saying there is, you know, actually, you don't do any kind of thing up front. You just go straight into the code, and you start working. And the problem of that is you will have an architecture. If architecture essentially is the structure of your system, your system will have a structure. If you don't design one, you'll get one. And that property is called emergent architecture, right? or accidental architecture. Now, you're going to get one, but you don't, you don't get to avoid having an architecture. You have one. You didn't think about it. So there are actually, in a lot of Agile methodologies, um, a part of the process where we begin to have some architectural thinking at the beginning of the process. Okay? And the idea is that, essentially, in order to build software that is evolutionary, in other words, that we can do iterative and incremental development with, we quite often have to do just enough up front to actually put in place the context that helps that. And the, the problem is that some of the early practitioners of XP, et cetera, were very experienced software developers for whom some of the things that you needed to do were just very natural. They did them automatically. And what people like Alistair pointed out is when you get less experienced teams, they're not automatically doing those things. And actually, from their point of view, it helps them to step back for a little bit and have a bit of thought before they actually tackle the work. Just because essentially you're, you're optimizing it, you're saying, because of my lack of experience, I'm going to basically compensate for that by giving you a little bit of upfront thinking time before you actually get started writing code. And you can see this in lots of situations when you interact with people, right? Some people, the way they work, actually, they much prefer to have a bit of reading time, a bit of time to think before they go and discuss the problem with you. OK. Um, and so they, 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 you, you can benefit from a little bit of thought, right? So. Let's get back to this statement that, that Grady Booch was making originally. He's saying basically, hey, architecture is the basically significant decisions that you're making. So in an agile project, one way to think of this is actually, this is not the architecture with structure of the system. But this is the practice of architecture. This is what architects do. The architects say, well, when I look at the structure of the system I'm going to be building, I need to have a think about the bits that are going to be hard to change or significant in terms of cost, right? That's what I need to focus on. And so, say for example, Crystal has this process where effectively it says, okay, during the kind of initial part of the project, we can run this thing that we tend to call an exploratory 360, where we are, should we, could we, how would we? And the time, the time scale is elastic, it's probably no more than two weeks, it might be as short as a day, depending on the size of what you're building, but you kind of sample the, use, the, 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 the problem space, you say, Kind of how would we build this? Are there any technologies we, we think we might want to use that we want to experiment with? So what XP calls spikes. So we can figure out whether they'd be suitable for us to actually use here or not, right? Rather than saying we're going to use it in the first couple of iterations and throw it away if it doesn't work, actually say, well, we'll just give it a little try. We'll probe and see what's there. And it'll give us a feel for whether actually it's workable to meet our, to meet our solutions. Are there any discussions we need to have with the business about the the, the things that they want the system to do, where we can see that this option is incredibly expensive, this option, effectively, they didn't mention is a lot cheaper, and maybe if they knew that other option existed, they'd have picked that one, right? So there's a, you have to do a little bit of upfront thinking. Um, and effectively, what you're trying to do is establish the technical plausibility of the project, right? So XP has something else, they call the exploratory phase. Um, but the same thing, effectively. They are trying to understand all the technologies they will use to create the production system, and they do it before the iteration process starts. So actually, there is, I would say to you, a distinct architectural place in most agile processes. There's a little there's a kind of a notion of a just enough upfront design. Um, 
So there's this notion we are used to quite a lot called a walking skeleton. The idea effectively is that you come up with a, come up with a plan, you say here are the key things that are architecturally significant for us to solve as problems, and you build just enough software to exercise that problem space and prove to yourself that you actually do have a workable solution before you put the flesh on it. So you de-risk effectively your architectural challenges as soon as you can, so that you essentially, if you discover the structure of your system is completely wrong, it's much easier then to throw it away and build another one before you start building all the features on top, which then becomes very expensive to effectively go in and actually change that in that structure once you have it and you own it. Okay. Um, let's go fast through that slide. So what you're trying to do essentially is get to this idea of saying, I want to basically as fast as possible increase my knowledge of the choices that I'm making for, about the structure of the system. And when I've validated those, I'll be able to move on with the functional work. And if Agile is a idea of doing experiments and getting feedback, we should do experiments and get feedback about the proposed structure of the system and whether it meets the quality attributes that we expect from it. Okay. Just saying that again. Um, right. So, um, as an architect, you have a lot of tools. And the question basically effectively is, if I talk about DDD, context built mapping, all those diagrams, et cetera, and I talked about basically walking skeletons, spikes, all those things to try and do this work, can we give you any advice on when you should use any of those over others? And we talked about, again, this notion of things that are hard to change, et cetera, but we could actually generalize that and say, our project probably has some identifiable risks. If we can't figure out what they are, we can all probably sit in a room and have kind of a, what am I afraid of session, right? And we can say those are the risks, those are the things that we think may burn us as we go and build out this system. And those are the places in this kind of early exploratory phase where we will spend our time, right? This is a diagram from a really good white paper you can go and read called How Much Upfront? Um, and it essentially says what are the trade-offs in the way you do things? So here essentially, for example, saying, my decision as to how, how much I go full on basically agile or do some design up front depends on forces such as what's the experience the developers I'm working with, how agile is the customer, what is the culture that they have already, right? If, it, if I have a very inexperienced team with a customer that's not very agile and the culture is, not, is, is very unlike agile, it may be that this process effectively of moving into a kind of response to change iterative architecture is not going to work for me. Okay, I'm over time slightly, or? Okay. All right. Cool. So we, we, we'll, we'll just speed through this tiny bit, because I'm running over time a bit, I think. Okay, so who is the software architect? Um, generally speaking, it's a role, and it may not necessarily be a useful title. The reason it may not be a useful title is because if you give someone the word architect in their title, it implies that they are responsible for the architecture of the system. And actually, everyone is responsible for the architecture of the system. And this is one of the things that Martin essentially objects to, which is the matrix figure. Figure in the matrix, the old whitehead guy sitting in the room, right, who is lord of the whole domain. And the problem with that is everybody needs to be involved in architecture. So architecture is kind of a role in which some people may effectively have a role of being an architect in the sense they have some responsibility for shaping the structure of the system. Uh, Simon basically comes up with this list of things that you will do as a software architect. Um, most of those are probably, hopefully, reasonably um, uh, understandable. But I, my model tends to be that you do these three things. You, build some, you help the teams build software, right? You don't build it yourself usually, but you help the teams build it and deliver it. Um, you mentor them, particularly you mentor them in architectural concerns. You, get, you help the team see the wider picture in the context that they're engaged with. And you do stakeholder management, and that's the bit that everyone hates. And that says, basically, you have to talk to the business, you have to talk to all the stakeholders, you have to explain what the team is doing, you have to run interference to the team and say, the team wants to build this complex technical thing, and this is why we're going to have to do it. Right. So that's the politics bit. You have to basically make sure that expectations are satisfied. OK. Um, I, I don't need to, I'm going to detail on these slides because of time, but this is Dad. It's by Scott Ambler. I don't necessarily like Dad. I'm not promoting it as a particular agile methodology, but it has some useful team structure diagrams you might want to go and look at. And one of the things it's really trying to say is there are some primary roles, roles rather than job titles, and some secondary roles. An architecture owner is a primary role in Dad. 
what they kind of say is depending on the size of the team, you may or may not have an explicit architect. So here they're saying in a small team, you know, an a, a, a XP style team of a dozen odd people, your team lead will maybe the architecture owner, right? If, that, if, the size of your pro if the size of your overall project is about 12 people, then maybe the team lead's also the architect. He has that role. If you get towards 10 to 40 people, though, you may need to change that. So you may at that point have to say, well, Actually, um, we're going to have to basically have someone who's an explicit architecture owner who sits over effectively a number of these teams, right? So he may own two or three teams and help them look after their architecture. So some places call this kind of role more a principal engineer kind of role, right? Someone who's basically helping a number of teams succeed at their goal. And if you get a really large organization, right? then you may end up with architecture as an actual leadership team where the people who are architecture owners to these smaller groups gather together in some kind of committee and discuss the overall direction of the overall platform that you're building and, it, and it's given direction. But my warning is this, right? Somebody always ends up in that role and if you don't decide who it is, much as the same way that you will always have an architecture whether you want one or not, you will always get an architect. And the thing is, it may be the guy who's the biggest bully in the team if you don't pick the guy who's actually got the most capability to do the job. And so where I see teams say, we don't need an architect, we don't need an architectural owner, uh, I always think that's very dangerous. That tends to mean the quiet guy who may actually be very smart is going to get eliminated from the process. You need to actually have somebody who you can go to and say, hey, what is the structure of what you're doing? What does it look like? What are the, the, what are the trade offs you're being forced to make here? Right? What are the risks you need to manage to succeed? Um, and so I would always try and make sure you explicitly choose somebody and delegate that person having technical authority in the team. All right, so I'm about to wrap, I think. Um, yeah, so this is just basically saying um, if you have, job, if you have architecture in your job title at all, please remember effectively one of your main jobs is to help everybody else do architecture. Right? It's not to basically say, I'm going to go off to my secret bunker and come back with the plans. Here you meet with everybody else in a room and you whiteboard it out together and you figure out what you're going to do. Right? You're, you are a facilitator of architecture happening. Um, and this is basically what's called an architecture design studio, which is this idea effectively you hold a meeting, you, bit of what, you get everyone involved, you do some brainstorming, you, everyone puts their ideas up without critique. And then effectively, the last stage is to essentially reject or approve those ideas as a team, right? And so this stage is important because sometimes somebody comes up with a really left field concept and it turns out that actually is brilliant. And you wouldn't have got that out if everyone was been afraid of the criticism happening too early on. All right. So there you go. Hopefully, to kind of wrap up, you can see that my point, would, point is there's a myth out there that we don't need software architects because in an agile world of self-organizing teams, that kind of uh, position is no longer required. But I think it's based on a couple of false notions. This notion of the architect sitting in his remote room dispensing uh, tablets of stone at the beginning of a waterfall-oriented process and that when we consider that the architecture is the structure of the system, it will always have one, and that we can identify what good structures are. They're ones where uh, the quality attributes of the system and its partitioning and uh, low coupling mean that effectively we have something that is, if you like, durable, has utility, and has beauty. Then effectively, there is definitely a need for an architect to help build that. And in an agile space, there is a clear portion of the Agile life cycle where we do some upfront architecture but continue to actually do architecture throughout the life cycle as a kind of guidance around that structural representation and that there will always be somebody effectively who fills that vacuum if you don't declare it. And that's, that's that. Thank you very much.